Hello everyone and welcome to today's GeoBytes presentation on understanding coastal processes. My name is Isabel and I'm one of the widening participation officers at the university. Today I am joined by Dr Andrew Miles who will be running the presentation. Hello Dr Miles. Hi. You'll see him shortly and in the background I also have my colleague Chantal who is moderating the question session section as they come in. Hello Hi, Chantal. Dr. Hiya. I will shortly be handing over to Dr Miles for the presentation and during the presentation you will be given the opportunity to ask questions in the chat function on the right hand side of the screen. Your audio and video won't be shared but you can ask questions anonymously if you wish. You just need to have ticked the box to say that you wish to be anonymous. You can like other questions that people may have asked to indicate you're also interested and we'd encourage you to do that so we know which questions are most popular. Chantal will collate the questions and then at the end of the session we'll ask them to Dr Miles. OK, I think we're ready to start, so it's over to you Dr Miles. Thank you very much. Uh, so good afternoon everybody, thank you for taking the time to, to come along to my talk today. So I guess just to introduce myself a little bit first, uh, yeah I am Dr Andrew Miles, uh, just Andrew is fine, and I'm a senior lecturer um, in the Department of Geography and International Development at the University of Chester and I kind of I kind of specialize in two areas, one of which is coastal processes that I'm talking about today. Uh, the other thing I actually do a lot of is GIS and remote sensing, so using geographical information systems and things like satellite imagery uh, to actually study coastal environments. But today I'm just going to give I guess a little bit of an overview in some ways of, of coastal processes, but maybe kind of questioning how we think about coasts and coastal environments and thinking about some of the key drivers and factors that control the kind of vast range of different coastal environments that we can encounter. So the first question that I'm going to ask is what is the coast? Because it's something that I guess we take for granted a lot of the time. We all have a kind of picture that jumps into our minds when we talk about the coast. And in many cases, that probably sandy beach environments are the kind of first thing that jump into to our mind. So I thought I'd start off with a, a definition of what is what is a coastline. So I, I looked up the different excuse me, the dictionary definition of coast. Uh, and interestingly, the, the first definition of coast that came up was the side of any body. So it turns out that coasts aren't automatically uh, related to the land sea interface. And I quite like that broad definition because I think in some ways that helps to actually highlight the breadth of what the coast is. Um, and obviously the second definition here is, is the one that really we think of the side of the land, the seaside, um, the countryside or the edge or margin of the land next to the sea. And I taught us to think for a minute what that really means in, in real terms. The fact that the coast is basically in its broadest sense just the point where terrestrial and marine environments meet. And as we hopefully know, sort of terrestrial environments can be hugely diverse. We have everything from deserts to ice caps um, marshes to kind of uh, jungles and, and plains. So there are all kinds of different environments and all of those have a whole host of different processes that control why and how they are the way they are. Uh, but at the coastline, we basically have all of those terrestrial processes meeting a whole nother set of processes that are coming in from the marine environment, the waves, the tides, the currents, um, and it's really the interaction of all of the processes from those two different environments that in my mind kind of make coasts such a diverse and interesting um, area of study because the coast isn't really in my mind one thing. It is this whole range of different environments but linked with a number of, of kind of common controlling factors that link them all together. And that gives us environments as diverse as beaches, 
um, which as I said for many of us are probably the first type of environment that, that come into our minds when we think about coasts. Uh, but what I want to highlight is that even just within that subset of coastal environments that we term beaches, there's still a huge range of diversity. Everything from kind of wide, flat, sandy, dissipative beaches, such as the, the example in the, the left hand image here, um, all the way over to much steeper, narrower, coarse grained beaches, much more reflective environments and everything in between. Obviously, you know, beaches don't just sit at one end or the other of a continuum. So we might talk about reflective beaches and dissipative beaches um, and, and maybe intermediate beaches, but obviously the reality is is much more complex that we have this continuum of, of different environments with features like cusps, bars, um, you know, all kinds of, of sub features, even just within this, this kind of smaller subcategory of coastal environments. Then we can jump to another type of environment and think about cliffs and rocky coasts. And once again, although we can lump this as one category of coastal environment, it's you know once again important to remember that there's actually a huge diversity just within these types of environments from our kind of very hard rock cliffs, maybe eroding very gradually at rates of millimeters per year up to our softer um, quaternary cliffs unconsolidated clays that could be eroding at rates of tens of meters per year and I'm sure some of you have probably looked at case studies linked to those environments places like the Holderness coast, Haysborough on the North Norfolk coast where there are significant erosion risks linked to the underlying geology of those regions and then there are, again are a whole range of other factors that start to come into play to shape these uh, rocky coasts so the type of geology, but also how how faulted it is, whether we have kind of very solid rocks that are hard to erode or whether we have lots of lines of weakness that um, the, the marine environment can then exploit to increase our erosion rates and create a whole host of features like caves, arches and stacks that we associate with these environments. And then again, we have our intertidal environments, so areas that are dominated much more by tidal variations than they are by wave energy. So again, this requires a kind of certain set of uh, terrestrial processes. We need to have a good supply of sediment in a lot of cases for, for these to be forming, but we also need to have a particular set of marine processes. In this case, we want kind of relatively large tidal ranges such that we have areas that are submerged and exposed at different times of day. Uh, but we also need quite low levels of wave energy because if we had bigger waves, then all of the fine sediments that need to be deposited in order to create these environments would be carried elsewhere. Um, and things like mudflats, um, salt marshes and mangrove forests wouldn't then form in those locations. And then we can bring in another set of factors and think about estuaries. So here we actually have as well as just our terrestrial and marine processes, we also have fluvial processes interacting. So we're kind of increasing the level of complexity of our coastal environments even further. We're still on this boundary where the land is meeting the sea, but uh, now we have the outflow of rivers. We have to con consider the kind of balance in terms of the amount of sediment that's flowing out of the river, the amount of water that's flowing out of the river. Um, with the strength of the waves and the tides in this particular location. And again, that can lead to a whole range of different morphologies just within this category of, of coastal environments, ranging from deltas. And again, even deltas on their own can take a, a whole range of different shapes, depending on the, the wave and tidal processes. Uh, we can have rivers that effectively kind of cut straight through the beach, and we can have much larger estuaries where we have uh, large expanses of, of mud and sand flats at, at low tide, all depending on the balance of the different processes at, at these locations. And then obviously we have the human factor because many of our coastlines aren't natural and you know, sometimes actually defining what's natural and what's managed isn't as, as clear cut as we might think because sometimes our, our management approaches and human interventions can take quite kind of subtle forms and have you know 
influences on, on the wider coastline that aren't necessarily obvious. But even within, again, the more kind of obvious category of managed coastlines, we have everything ranging from small coastal villages, fishing towns, to large ports and harbours, to places like Dubai, where we're actually building out into the sea and actually completely altering the natural coastal processes that would be occurring in those locations as a result of, of human intervention. So a whole range of scales in terms of the, the extent to which we're shaping the coastline and also the extent to which that's going to have knock on effects on neighbouring areas of, of coast. And you know this is by no means the, the full range of, of coastal environments. Um, I was trying to think earlier of different categories of coastline that I have not included here. And I think one that we often don't think about are icy coasts. So actually there are some parts of the world where our coastlines are dominated by the interaction between marine processes and glaciers and ice caps. Maybe the ocean is frozen for half the year and actually we only have six months where we get the normal movement of, of waves and that kind of interaction with the, the terrestrial processes. And I think sometimes this can be one of the reasons that, that coasts can be quite a, a daunting topic to study because we have this huge array of environments, all of which fall under this this one category of of coasts so how do we kind of make sense of this this vast array of environments um, in, a, in a kind of meaningful and an understandable way so the first thing we need to think about really are what are the common factors that are influencing these coastlines because there will be similarities you know whether we're looking at a managed coastline or um, a, a tidally dominated system or an estuary. There will be factors that that link them and processes that that are happening in common. So I had to think about some of the, the key ones. Um, so these are some of the ones that I came up with, the underlying geology, and that's going to have an influence on the type of sediment that's available, how much sediment, uh, the continental shelves, so actually the shape of the ocean basins as we move away from the coast into deeper water. Is that is that very steep? Does it drop off? quickly into the open ocean or are we looking at much wider shallower continental shelves uh, the wind conditions obviously the long-term climate and i'm sure you're all very aware of the impacts of, of climate change and sea level rise on coastal environments uh, the interaction with rivers so the outflow of sediments um, onto the coastline and also the outflow of water and the balance of that versus the the influx from the tides and actually the sediment that's being deposited in those rivers from the wider coast and as we've already seen, human activities um, and some of our big driving hydrodynamic processes, so the waves and the tides that are, are some of the most significant factors in determining the specific coastal environment at any given location and in shaping those environments in the longer term. So you've probably all approached these in, in perhaps slightly different ways as you've uh, gone through the, the courses of your study. So one of the ways um, that I use to, to help break down these complex systems and make them more manageable is something called the morphodynamic approach. So this is something that I use with uh, my students within the, uh, the coastal modules that I run. And the morphodynamic approach basically breaks our coastal system down into four main components with a number of kind of external influencing factors that then uh, link in with these. So our main components are sediment transport because ultimately it's actually the patterns of sediment transport, where sediment's being moved from, where it's being deposited that are going to shape many of the features that we see on our coasts. These are driven by hydrodynamic processes. So the hydrodynamic processes are our waves and tides and currents uh, that are bringing the energy into the coastal system to, to drive the changes. And the, the processes driving sediment transport then give rise to the morphology. So these are the, the physical features and landforms that we see on any given section of coastline. Um, and it's important to note that we have this kind of feedback mechanism between all of these. So if we make if we change any one component of our coastal system then that's actually going to have knock-on effects and alter the rest of the coastline so if the the waves and tides change you know say our waves become bigger as a result of climate change 
then that's going to change sediment transport. So maybe we're going to see more sediment moving around the area. Maybe uh, the main areas, regions of sediment transport on the coastline are going to be in slightly different locations. And that's then going to lead to different patterns in terms of erosion and deposition and change the morphology of the coastline. So we're going to see different features forming, maybe features that were there disappearing. Um, by changing those features, that's in turn going to have a feedback effect on the processes, because if we get, say, shallower areas in different locations, that's going to cause waves to break over those shallow areas and again alter the processes of sediment transport and we get a kind of continuous feedback loop. And this is one of the reasons that coasts are kind of so dynamic and continuously changing. And theoretically, we might eventually reach a kind of equilibrium position where all of our forces are in balance and we don't really see any more long term changes occurring within our coastal system. But actually it's it's relatively uncommon that we ever reach that point in, in most coastal environments. We'll see some kind of change, whether that's seasonal changes, whether it's the influence of storms or whether it's longer term climatic change. And then as these processes occur over much longer time periods, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years, that gives rise to the stratigraphy, the kind of layers that represent the different environments that have been present at that location. And then feeding into this are all the factors that I've already mentioned. So the sediments, the geology, the continental shelves, the rivers, human activities, climate, wind, tides, waves, all of those are feeding in. Um, so I just want to very briefly mention some of the, the processes in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so particularly some of our main hydrodynamic processes, because to me these uh, as I as I mentioned, the kind of key to why coasts are so dynamic. It's because we've got so much energy that's accumulated across the oceans and impacting on the land at these these boundaries. So interestingly, when we talk about waves, there are actually many different types of wave uh, within the oceans. And what we normally mean when we talk about waves are what we call wind waves or surface waves. Uh, but interestingly, tides are actually also a type of wave, although they occur obviously on a very different scale to, to wind waves. Uh, there are actually something called internal waves that happen out in the, particularly in the deeper ocean, where we get waves actually occurring at different layers within the, the ocean's waters. Uh, we obviously have tsunamis, a very different type of wave driven by geological activity. Uh, and also storm surges are, are a type of wave, and you, you may have come across those as well. And, you know, waves effectively are, uh, a transfer of energy there, a movement within the atmosphere, the wind driven by the sun ultimately, um, and that energy is then being transferred to the oceans and transferred across the surface of the oceans until eventually most of that energy will be dissipated when it reaches the land. And that just kind of emphasizes again why these are such energetic environments. You know, the oceans obviously are huge, they cover two thirds of the Earth's surface, and so that's a huge area to be you know, gaining energy that's been transferred to the oceans from the atmosphere and eventually that energy is going to find its way um, to the coast and cause all of the changes and result in the different types of environment that we that we see there. Now I'm aware that I'm already probably running slightly behind on time so I apologize if I move through some of these a bit quickly. Um, so tides, again, I'm sure you're all aware of, of what tides are and, and what they do. So these daily movements of the water uh, driven primarily by astronomical forcing. So the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon causing movements of the water within the, the ocean basins. Um, and that results in this change in the, the elevation of the ocean surface over the, the course of the day. But what's also interesting is obviously the fact that tides aren't the same everywhere on, on Earth. So they're dominated by these lunar and solar cycles, the relative positions of the sun and the moon over days and weeks and months and years. Uh, but they're also influenced by the size of ocean basins and that breaks the Earth system down into a number of smaller tidal systems because obviously water can't move freely around the the surface of the planet. And then within each of these systems, the exact tidal 
pattern at any particular point on the coast is going to depend on how far away it is from the centre of that system. Generally, the further away, the bigger the tidal range will become, uh, but also the pattern of movement within that system. So typically what we would expect to happen is that we get two high tides and two low tides every day, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, but there are places in the world where due to the shape of their ocean basins and the way the water moves within it, we only get one high tide and one low tide per day. Or perhaps we get two high tides and two low tides, but one is much bigger than than the other. And we can also get much local, uh, much more local influences due to the local bathymetry. So things like estuaries channeling the water, exaggerating tidal ranges even further and also atmospheric conditions, which then stack on top of what we expect to happen in terms of the the vertical movement of the the ocean and can actually lead to much more unexpected events um, and often responsible for for the kind of flooding events that we experience at the coast um, that links in with the the concept of, of storm surges and again you may well be aware of storm surges so these are effectively changes in the the ocean surface that occur due to the much lower air pressure that occurs when storm systems are coming in. Uh, and this was the, the best figure that I could find to illustrate it. Um, obviously, it's a, an American figure and therefore in feet. So if you're not familiar with feet, a foot is about 30 centimetres. So length of a 30 centimetre ruler. Uh, or if you want a very rough approximation into metres, kind of three feet is a bit less than a metre. Uh, and obviously in the US, they get hurricanes, which are extreme storm systems, very low pressure systems. And this kind of demonstrates how big an influence that can actually have on uh, the, the water levels in the ocean. So we can have a tide that's expected to be 60 centimetres high. And then we can have almost another five metres on top of that uh, due to storm surge. So huge increases in what we would normally expect the tides to be as a result of um, these extreme storm systems coming in. And then obviously we have the height of, of the storm waves on top of that. So that's why these events are so important um, when it comes to managing coastlines, understanding how frequent they are, understanding how big these kind of events can be so that we can try and predict and manage the, the future flood risk. Um, and one of the big concerns is that these are the kind of things that could get worse as a result of climate change and then being added in on top of, of sea level rise. So I throwed a lot of information at you at you there, but like I said, what I really wanted to get you thinking about is just the, the diversity and um, variation within coastal environments, but also the fact that we have these common factors that allow us to link all of those different coastal environments together and hopefully gain some, some meaningful understanding despite all of the complex processes that are coming into play. So very finally, and I'm going to go through these quite quickly, kind of why why do we want to, to study coasts? Um, and obviously I might be a little bit biased because I've spent a lot of time studying them already. Um, but to me, you know, what makes coasts interesting is the fact that they're, they're very dynamic environments. They can change so quickly um, and storms are, are a big factor in that. So, you know, I think there's not many environments where we can have a big storm event come in and the whole elevation of the, the landscape can drop by meters overnight across tens or hundreds of kilometers of coastline. Um, as I've already said, they're very diverse. Uh, they're extremely complex and energetic. We have all of these different factors interacting. And while that makes them challenging to understand, you know, to me, that also makes them interesting. And they're very important environments. They're very important ecologically. There's a huge range of, of species that live in coastal environments. And actually, things like salt marshes and mangrove forests are some of the most ecologically diverse environments in the world outside of places like rainforests. And they're the kind of environments that are also highly threatened by sea level rise and by climate change. So it's critical that we understand these environments so that we can try and preserve them and make sure that we maintain all of their ecological functions and the benefits that they provide as we move into the future. And from a more human perspective, they're hugely economically important. Uh, billions of tons of cargo are transported by ship each year, and all of that has to leave the coastline and it has to arrive at the coastline at the other end. 
So, you know, from the, the point of view of maintaining trade, it's critical that we can protect and manage our coastlines. Uh, but also a lot of our infrastructure tends to be at the coast, power stations, oil refineries, um, offshore wind farms even, you know, all of these are things that are located in coastal environments. And in order to make sure that we're, you know, maintaining a, a kind of sustainable economy in the long run, we need to ensure that all of these uh, locations, all of these systems are understood and and being kind of developed in a sustainable way as well. And for the people that live there, they're obviously critically important. So 44% uh, of the world's population live within 150 kilometers of the sea. That might sound a long way, but actually that's that's the kind of area that's considered to be influenced by what happens at the coast. Uh, but probably more directly, most of the world's mega cities are also coastal. So these are the, the biggest cities with more than two and a half million people. And that's because of the benefits that the coasts provide for, for transport, for trade, um, for, for food. Um, and obviously we like coastal environments for, for recreation and holidays. They're somewhere that we like to go and visit. So just for our own kind of well-being, uh, it's, it's important to, to be able to maintain and protect these environments as we move into the future. And as I said, to me, they're interesting. You know, they're, they're so diverse. They operate over a huge range of uh, spatial and temporal scales. And there's still many questions, even though we've studied coastal environments for, for hundreds of years, there's still a lot we don't understand. There's still many questions um, remaining to be answered. So to kind of summarize, uh, hopefully I've, I've kind of got across my, my key point that Coasts are hugely diverse and dynamic and interesting environments, and they're influenced by a huge range of, of physical and human factors, and they're changing all the time on scales from seconds to millennia. And if we want to fully understand them, we need to try and integrate our understanding of, of all of those things together. And as I said, that, that can be challenging, but it's a, a very interesting and exciting challenge to take on. And Really, coasts are only going to become more relevant over years to come as we fight the challenges of sea level rise and climate change, and we try to manage some of these unique and important environments. You know, it's critical that we study the coast and that we continue to increase our understanding and try and you know develop the ways that we work with the coast um, to, to preserve these environments as we as we move forward into the future. So thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope that was was interesting. I appreciate I've, I've given you an awful lot to, to think about there, but hopefully it's like I said, maybe given you a new perspective on some things that you've looked at already um, and maybe brought together some of the, the ideas that you've looked at before. So uh, here are, are my contact details and please do feel free to, to get in touch if you've got any questions about anything that I've, that I've talked about today. Uh, so yeah, thanks a lot for your attention. Oh, brilliant. That was uh, really good. Thank you very much, Andrew. I'm just going to check with Chantal, see if we've got some questions for you. Uh, hi, yes, we do. Um, so we've got about five or six, actually, with possibly a couple more coming in. Um, so we'll just work their way our way through them, Andrew, if that's OK. Um, so the first one is why are tides different in different places? OK, so there's a number of factors that, that come into play and I kind of briefly, briefly mentioned some of those. So as I said, they're, they're driven obviously by the, the sun and the moon. So in theory, we'd expect them to nicely follow the patterns um, as so it very much follows lunar cycles. So if we have full moon and new moon, we'd expect the tides to be bigger. Um, at, at the half moons, we'd expect them to be smaller. And obviously the complexity comes when we have the, the land masses that get in the way. So the water can't just kind of freely move around the globe. It has to kind of slosh around within the ocean basins, a bit like water in a in a bathtub. And it is very much a kind of almost circular motion around the ocean basins. And really the, the differences at different places come down to the fact that different ocean basins are different sizes. So the waves move around them in slightly different ways. And also, as I mentioned, the, the kind of specific shape of the coastline sometimes at different locations. So, uh, I mean, typically if we're closer to the middle of a, a tidal system, the tidal range will be smaller. It kind of operates almost like a, a seesaw. If you 
look across it. So the closer you are to the middle, the less it actually moves up and down either side. The further away you get from the centre of the, the system, the bigger that movement, so the bigger the, the tidal range at that, at that location. But as I said, it's also those more local factors as well. That ties really nicely into our second question, which is uh, will tides always behave in roughly the same way in the same places? Um, the short answer is is yes, uh, they are. Tides are very predictable. So because uh, we understand the movements of the sun and the moon and, and the earth kind of relative to each other, actually tides are something we can predict tides um, sort of years into the future with a, a pretty good degree of accuracy. So uh, the short answer is yes, the, the uncertainty really is the, the weather systems on top. So as I mentioned about uh, uh, storm surges, so often if you look at the tidal prediction and then go to a place and what you see is very different, the chances are that the reason for that difference is, is actually due to the, the weather, the meteorology, which changes much more quickly and is much less predictable uh, than the, the astronomical drivers behind the, the tides themselves. Thank you. And um, the next one is a wave based question. Um, how are tsunamis different from tidal waves? Excellent question. <laughs> um, so. Tsunamis are, as I said, they're, they're obviously driven by geological events, so an earthquake or an undersea landslide um, that displaces the water and. They move very quickly, so it's sort of hundreds of, of kilometers per hour. Uh, and they're very kind of long waves. And actually the reason tsunamis are dangerous is due to an effect called shoaling, uh, which again, you may have uh, may have studied. It's basically where as waves approach the coast, they start to slow down and they get narrower and steeper. So because tsunamis are, are kind of so big, they get narrower and steeper as they very quickly approach the coast. Uh, and that's what causes them to build up into the huge waves that obviously cause the, the damage that we all associate with tsunamis. Whereas tides are obviously much slower moving, so actually tides will still undergo uh, shoaling to some extent, and that's why they can get bigger if they move into things like estuaries, uh, but they're, they're kind of much slower moving. They don't kind of steepen to, to the same degree, uh, and obviously they're being kind of driven by by different forces as well. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, the next two are quite closely related. They both uh, relate to climate change. Um, the first one is how will climate change impact on the intensity and variation of tides or, or how does it impact? Yeah, um, so. It probably won't alter the tidal patterns hugely at, at given locations. What it will do is obviously change where the tides are reaching on the on the land. So. As sea levels increase, obviously that will, you know, what would be our high tide at the moment will become even higher as we as we move forwards over time. And that will actually lead to, you know, a much greater frequency of, of flood events. And it's it's quite interesting. You actually don't need a very big increase in water levels. If we we often talk about floods in terms of return periods, so you know, a one in 10 year flood event or a one in a hundred year flood event. Uh, and actually the difference between a one in 10 year flood event and a one in 100 might only be say 20 or 30 centimetres. So actually if we get sea level rise of, of 30 centimetres, then you know water level that we would have only expected to reach once in 100 years, we'll actually start to see on average once every 10 years instead. So yeah, so it won't really change the, the pattern of tides, but it will change kind of where they're reaching and, and obviously therefore the impact that they're going to have on the on the land behind them. Thank you. The next one is very closely related, but it the they're asking about um, how climate change and sea level rise will affect coastal processes as a whole. So uh, I think yeah. you probably already partially answered that, but yes, yeah, so it, it kind of builds on what I was just saying. So obviously, yeah, as water levels increase, um, tides will, will reach up higher, but it will also allow kind of bigger and more energetic waves to, to reach the coast. That's one of the other kind of main impacts that's expected because Waves obviously break as they enter shallow water, so the deeper the water is, uh, the later the waves are going to break and the bigger waves will be able to reach a certain area. And that's obviously going to increase erosion. So in places where we've already got erosion, we would expect to see that increase. Um, and it may be that places that are kind of stable at the moment could start to experience erosion as a result of sea level rise. Um, it's also going to be a problem for things like salt marshes and the intertidal environments that I mentioned because they're quite finely balanced. They require they need to be flooded with seawater for a certain amount of the day, but also exposed. And 
if it's completely natural, they might retreat in line with sea level rise. So, you know, the tides will move further inland, the marsh will move further inland as well. But actually, if there's some kind of barrier, whether that's a, a kind of change in geology or whether that's human settlements that are stopping it from moving, then actually we could start to see those, um, some of those environments squeezed out of existence in a, yeah, we call the, the process coastal squeeze. So it is a, a big threat to, to those kind of environments if we don't make sure there's space for them to, to migrate into. Thank you. The final question follows on from that really is how do you see coastal management changing in, fu in the future with climate change? Excellent. That's a, a really good one. So I think, I mean, I think there's already started to, to be a bit of a change in that we've moved away more from the, the hard engineering approaches where we have kind of physical structures. Uh, they're still necessary in some locations, but I think there has been a move to, to softer approaches already where we're trying to work with natural systems. So kind of nourishing beaches, uh, building up dune systems and even taking on kind of managed realignment approaches where we kind of breach existing defences to allow areas to flood and create new areas of, of things like salt marsh. And I think as we move forward, uh, in some locations, you know, if we look at major cities, for example, we probably will have to keep using hard defences because, you know, relocating them isn't a viable option. But increasingly, we may have to relocate people um, because actually just the cost of defending areas won't be viable anymore. And we already have examples of that even in the UK. Um, Fairbourne on the, the Welsh coast um, has, has been identified as somewhere that's not going to be defensible in uh, I forget the exact timeline they've got for it now but basically they've said the cost of defense going forward is too high and actually people are going to have to start moving out of there because it is going to be lost to to sea level rise um, in the future and I think you know that there, there is going to be a, an increasing incidence of of decisions like that just because the yeah it will become more and more expensive and harder to to protect places. Great, thank you. I think that's all the questions. So uh, thank you for those answers. They were very interesting. Yeah, you're very welcome. And yeah, I, I hope you all found that interesting. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much to um, Dr. Andrew Mars for that session today. I hope everybody has really enjoyed that session and found it useful. And there were some fantastic questions there. Um, we look forward to giving the opportunity to attend further events. We have another Geobytes talk next week. For more information, you can go to our website, which I'm going to post the link in the box on the right. I've also put the link to the geography department there so you can find out more about the courses we offer and um, the different staff. And there's lots of information on our website that you can dive into. But for now, that's everything. So we hope you've enjoyed today um, and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>